I want you to reconsider your place in history. God's kingdom has already broken into the world, but it has not yet fully arrived. We live in between. We must fight to remember the future we know is coming by fixing our gaze on our triumphant Savior. Welcome, Mercy Hill. If you're newer with us, my name is Brian. I'm one of the pastors here. We are certainly glad that you are here as we continue in our series going through the book of Ephesians. Ephesians, like much of the Bible, takes the way we normally view things and kind of flips them on their head, right? Like a few hundred years ago, people thought that the earth was at the center of the universe. And then a guy named Nicholas Copernicus comes along and he says, no, it's not the earth that's at the center, but actually the sun is the center of the solar system. And it completely revolutionized the way that we view our world and the universe that we live in. The reason we come here on a weekly basis and gather is to explore God's Word because it helps us to see things rightly. It changes our perspective. And the perspective that's going to help us change today is our view of marriage. Now, I know as soon as you hear that the message is on marriage, uh, you know, there's kind of the, the air goes out of the room, right? Because the single unmarried people, they think, well, that's not for me. Um, the people who are married, uh, you, you know the challenges of marriage, and so you kind of brace for impact, like, well, okay, where are we going with this? Uh, the only people that are typically excited to hear a message on marriage is the, are the people who have either just gotten married or are about to be married, they're engaged. But hang with me because there is so much value for us when we understand marriage rightly. What if what you think about marriage is not at all what marriage is meant to be? The way we normally think about marriage is we think about it and how it relates to us. We think about how I am connected to marriage. Right, I'll give you guys an example. Uh, on my wedding day, 11 and a half years ago, I was standing in a church building. Um, you know, now no one gets married in a church building anymore. It's either a barn or a warehouse. Um, so, you know, we're kind of traditional in that way. But so there I was standing in a church building, and beside me were my groomsmen. My groomsmen, who are my best friends, they had rearranged their schedule, taken off of work, spent more than they could afford on the tuxedos that we were asking them to rent. And why did they do it? They did it to be there, to be there with me. Coming into the church building, were people that I vaguely knew because they were the friends of my parents. Yet they came with gifts for me. And then the climax of the whole day was when a beautiful young girl professed her undying love and commitment to none other than me, right? How could marriage not be about me? Our culture, it pumps this idea that marriage is for you from both ends of the spectrum, right? On one end, our culture says, hey, if marriage is going to make you happy, if marriage is going to give you security, then go for it. On the other hand, it says, if marriage is going to tie you down and limit your options, then you can just dismiss it. Do with marriage whatever you want. You can start it. You can stop it. You can redefine it because marriage is about you. But what if marriage is not about you? What if we're not at the very center of it all? A couple nights ago, I was laying in bed. Middle of the night, I was asleep, and I was woken up by the scream from my youngest son. Did I immediately jump into action and see if there was an intruder in the house? Did I immediately go to his room to console my terrified child? Of course not. I laid there as still as I could, hoping that my wife Lindsay did not realize that I was awake. Because I didn't want to have to get up there. I think she was doing the exact same thing. <laughs> so during the moments that we were having this kind of silent duel, seeing, okay, who's going to be the first person to give in and go up there and console our child? Uh, I'm laying there, and you know what I began doing? I began keeping score. And if you're married, you know what I'm talking about here. I began thinking, oh, I got up last time with him, one point for me. Oh, I got to get up early in the morning. You know, I got to pack lunches. I got to make breakfast. Another point for me. We do this all the time if you're married. You keep score thinking that what I contribute is more than what the other person has contributed. Therefore, I shouldn't have to do this, and, and that person should have to do this. Why do we do that? Because we think marriage is all about me. Why do I am eager to give, to show affection and gratitude when my wife is in a good mood, but when she's not, I'm fine just to kind of leave her be? Well, it's because I think marriage is all about me. It's about my expectations being met, my desires being filled. 
But the revolutionary idea that we need to concede to today is that marriage is not about you. Marriage is not about you. So what is it about? Well, that's why we're going to go to Ephesians chapter 5. So if you have a copy of the Bible, you can turn there or you have a Bible app, pull it up. If you don't, it'll be on the screen. But Ephesians chapter 5 shows us that if marriage is not about you, what is it about? It tells us what marriage is all about. And so I'm going to walk us through this text. We'll see how God intended, what God intended for marriage to be about. And then we'll talk about some practical applications. The author, Paul, he, he dives in by setting the stage with instructions for every follower of Jesus. Okay, so regardless of if you're married or unmarried in this room, this is written for you. Ephesians 5 verse 1, he says, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Okay, so what Paul is doing In these last few chapters of the book of Ephesians, he's transitioning away from talking about what God has done for us into now how we are to live in response. And that order is important. You see, the order that we typically go about life is we think through, okay, well, this is what I've got to do in order to earn this. This is what I've got to do now in order to become that. But the Bible completely flips that order for those of us who are believers and says, no, it's because of who God has made you to be then you now live in response, right? Like our behavior is not to earn God's favor, but it's in response to God's favor. And here specifically, we are called to imitate God by loving as Jesus has loved us. A couple months ago, I introduced my older boys to the greatest movie of all time, The Sandlot, okay? And towards the end of the movie... Uh, the hero, Benny, is going to retrieve that ball that they've lost away from that wild and crazy dog, and he's going to do it by jumping over the fence. But before he does it, he breaks out the secret weapon, a brand new pair of sneakers, PF flyers to be exact, right? Shoes that were guaranteed to make a kid run faster and jump higher. Well, my middle son, he saw that with eyes this big around, and he was like, I want some PF flyers. Well, I was thinking to myself, okay, this movie was made in the 90s. It depicts a story from the 60s. Like, there's no way that he, we're going to be able to find P.F. Flyers for him. My wife kind of nudges me and says, they got them on Amazon. <laughs> and so he begins uh, doing extra chores, you know, dusting the baseboards and, and all kinds of stuff, washing windows, folding laundry in order to earn money to buy those P.F. Flyers. Why? Because he wanted to imitate the hero of that movie. He wanted to wear those shoes, look the part, act the part. To imitate someone is to act like them, follow their example. Every instruction given in this passage, whether it's going to be specifically to husbands or specifically to wives, it's given as a way to imitate God. Something that we are all called to do. It's important because that means that every instruction that's given specifically to a wife is a way for her to imitate God. And every instruction that's given to a husband, it's a way for him to imitate God. Before we go in and read the passages it's where Paul specifically begins talking about marriage and husbands and wives, I, I want to kind of say two, two things here, okay? First, I want to say that this passage does elevate our view. It's meant to elevate our view of marriage, but it's not elevating married people. I think we get that wrong a lot of times. Sometimes we get that wrong in the church, and it can be easy where it feels like, you know, there's a lot of emphasis on, on family ministries, which is all good, that sometimes I think the single unmarried people feel like they're kind of second class. But that is not the case. The Apostle Paul who wrote this letter, he was himself unmarried and single, and he wrote to the Corinthians, he said, I wish some of you were like I were. I wish you were single. He says there is value to being single. There is value to being married. And we want to see the value in both. So we're trying to, yes, take the same high view of marriage that the Bible gives us. But we're not trying to elevate married people over those who are unmarried. The second thing I want to say before we get in this passage is let's be aware of our own heart's tendency. Okay, Our own heart's tendency is to focus in on what other people are supposed to be doing rather than what we are supposed to be doing. Right? Let me just give you an example from my own life. So several years ago, I picked up a copy of the book, Five Love Languages. Many of you guys are probably familiar with it. You've probably been helped by it, beneficial. But let me just kind of tell you uh, how, how I responded to the book. Okay, so the problem is not with the book. The problem was with me. 
Rather than, the, the reason I first got the book was so that I could uh, creatively express love to my wife. But then what I began doing, instead of creatively expressing love to her, I began critiquing her love for me. I began thinking, well, if you really love me, you would do it in this way and that way. You would show it this way. You see, our tendency is to focus in on what other people should be doing rather than what we ourselves are called to do. And there's a danger in this passage to do that very thing because some of the things are told specifically to wives, some are told specifically to husbands. And it would be very easy for us to kind of nudge the person beside you and say, did you hear that? Did you hear that? When really we need to focus on what we are being called to do. All right, so with that being said, let's read the passage. Remembering that the instructions given are ways that each spouse can imitate God. Ephesians 5.22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. That word submit, it makes some of you cringe. I know. And we're going to look into it. I'm not going to skirt past the issue. But there's something bigger we need to see first. Notice right from the start that Jesus is in view here. Everything that is commanded is with respect to Jesus. It says, as to the Lord. So marriage is not about you. Marriage is not even about your spouse. Wives, Jesus is Lord, not your husband. Verse 23, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Again, we'll get into the details of what it means to be the head and what submission looks like in a moment. But for now, the important thing for us to see is that there is a connection Paul is making between the relationship between a husband and wife and the relationship between Jesus and the church. And that connection that keeps building. Look at verse 25. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Why did he do that? That he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. So that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Okay, so whether married or unmarried in the room, if you are a follower of Jesus... You are united to him, united like parts of the body are all together one. United like individual married couples become united and become one. All right, so just pause and think about that. Think about Jesus, creator of the universe, king of kings, lord of lords. He has united himself, joined himself to his people. So if there's ever a doubt in your mind, if Jesus is going to take care of his church. If there's ever a doubt in your mind, if Jesus is going to protect the church from the evil one, if there's ever a doubt in your mind, if Jesus has waned in his affection for you, know that he has joined himself to the church. The church is his bride. The church is his body. You see, true marriage, it's not just a declaration of current, present love. It's actually a promise of future love. And the promise that we get here is that Jesus is not going to let go of his bride. So you see, marriage is not really about you. Marriage is a picture. It's an illustration that's helping us to understand a greater reality. Marriage was created to point us to Christ's loving union with the church. Paul, he even goes back to refer to when marriage was first instituted in Genesis chapter 2. He quotes it in verse 31. He says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. He says this mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. Marriage is not about you. Marriage was created to be a picture of the unity between God and his people, between Jesus and the church. Illustrations, they help us grasp truth that's, that's hard to understand, right? Things that are hard to comprehend. We need illustrations to help us. It's hard to comprehend why a perfect, holy, sovereign God would join himself to imperfect people like us. But we can grasp that when a man and a woman come together in God's design for marriage, that there is a big change that happens, Right? The individuals getting married, they separate, separate out from living with mom and dad, and they become one with each other. A new status 
is given. A new family is formed and priorities change. Well, every one of us, we once lived separated, apart from God. But because of God's great love, because he is rich in mercy, those who have received grace through faith in Jesus, we have been united to him. We no longer belong to our old ways, but we are part of his family. Our priority is Jesus first. And so marriage is a picture of Christ's love for the church. And oh, what love that is. God's love. It's a never-ending, a never-failing, never-giving-up, forever love. God has shown his love by the covenant that he made with his people. His promise to say, I will be your God and you will be my people. And God has shown his love by setting his people apart, making us his treasure, not because of anything worthy or admirable within us. The Bible says that God chose us because he chose us. He loves us because he loves us. If there ever was a relationship that should have dissolved, it was a relationship between God and his people. Because God's people, constantly disobeying, constantly chasing after other things, worshiping created things rather than the creator himself, yet in spite of our unfaithfulness, God remains true to his promise. When you guys go to a, a wedding, everything's beautiful, right? I mean, everybody dresses their, their nicest. Um, the, the bride, I mean, she is just stunning in brilliance. The groom, he looks all right. You know, he tried his hardest, but... I mean, it's just beautiful when you go to a wedding. And, and, and the vows that they make together, the promises that they are making together, it is a beautiful display of their affection and their commitment. But there's something even more beautiful. There's something even more true and beautiful than a promise made, and that is a promise kept. There's no truer beauty than when a promise is kept and when it's kept even at great cost. God the Father kept his promise to us at the cost of his Son. John 15, 13 says, Greater love has no one than this, that someone laid down his life for his friends. And Romans 5, 8 says that God shows us his love and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So as a picture of God's generous and costly love, marriage is to be a lifelong covenant between a man and a woman when they promise to give themselves completely and share all that they have with the other. Now, I realize that there are probably in here marriages that are struggling. And if you're thinking, my marriage is not a picture of generosity. My marriage is not a picture of unity. My marriage is more a picture of conflict and little battles of control. I realize that there is not a single marriage on the planet that perfectly pictures God's love. And that's because every Marriage has the same thing in common. And that's that the individuals who come together in marriage are imperfect people themselves. We are what the Bible calls sinners. We're broken. And our first reaction is to always think of ourselves first. And because of that, there's a lot of strife. There's fracturing of relationship. There's self-protecting behavior. And there's pain for others and ourselves that follows. Because marriage can display God's love for the church, don't think that the enemy doesn't want to destroy our marriages. But when the commitment to marriage takes priority over the chemistry in marriage, it is a beautiful reminder that Jesus is not letting go of his bride. And because of Jesus' commitment to his bride, there is hope for you. And there's hope for your marriage. So don't just look for the exit when things get tough. Look for help. Invite others who will stand with you and help you to persevere in your marriage. Here at Mercy Hill, very practically, the way to do that is to get in a community group and share with that group leader. But maybe you're not in a group. We, we also want to help you. And so what you can do is you can text HEALING to 41411. If you text HEALING to 41411, it's going to get you connected with one of our pastors, and we are going to get you connected to the resources, and we will stand with you as you fight for the good of your marriage. You know, I believe seeing that marriage was created to be an illustration of Christ's love for the church, it does several practical things, both for the married and the unmarried. Number one, it calls those who are married to a higher commitment to their marriage. 
to stand by those promises that they made. Your marriage should not be neglected, and your marriage should not be taken for granted. I believe that seeing marriage as an illustration of Christ's love for the church allows the unmarried to be glad for those who are married. If you're unmarried and single, you may desire to be married, but you can rest knowing that everything that marriage is really trying to point us to is already guaranteed for you in Christ. You might not be married in this earth, but there is a greater marriage to come, which is yours to the fullest. Third, I think seeing that marriage is an illustration of Christ's love for the church, it frees those with a failed marriage from identifying as failures themselves. You see, because marriage is not ultimate. And the only ultimate failure is to die apart from Christ. So seeing that marriage was created to be an illustration of Christ's love for the church, it shows us that marriage is incredibly meaningful, but it is not ultimate. You could think of it like this. Marriage is not an object of worship, but an act of worship. Right? It's not an object of worship. I think of the parents with grown adult children, and those children might not yet be married yet. Are you imposing your idol of marriage for your child on them? Marriage is not something to be worshipped. We are not merely treating our spouse in response to how they treat us. We are called to treat our spouse in response to how God has treated us. So how would marriage be different if we imitated God's self-sacrificing love? Well, Paul, he guides us back down into everyday living at the end of the passage. Verse 33, he says, However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. So I want to move now to a time where we're kind of applying this, speaking directly to wives and directly to husbands. The way to reflect God's love in your marriage is to pattern your marriage after God's love. Okay? And so what I want you to kind of take home with today is this. Be an imitator of God's love to your spouse. We are all called to imitate God's love. And so how, if you are married, can you imitate God's love to your spouse? God's love is self-sacrificing. It's shown by giving oneself up for the good of another. So let's talk about the roles. The roles that we are given as either husbands or wives. Ephesians 5.22 says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Now, no doubt, the reason this teaching that wives are to submit to their husbands is a touchy subject is because it has been widely abused. It has. And the proper response when this passage has been abused and misapplied, is to repent and lament. The church should be in anguish when our sisters are abused because this text is misapplied. Wives submitting to husbands, it's it's a touchy subject because it's connected to our gender. No one gets upset when parents are told to respect and follow the lead of their, uh, when children are told to respect and follow the lead of their parents, or when employees are told to respect their bosses or citizens, their, their leaders. But because the differences in roles are connected to our gender, it just feels different. And it does. I, I get that. But notice it doesn't say women submit to men. It says wives submit to your own husbands. The Bible takes our gender differences seriously. There's a reason that God created humankind, both male and female. And there's a reason why each person in this room was created either male or female. And that's because there are strengths that each gender have that are meant to complement the other. Now, if you want to explore more of God's design in creating humankind, male and female, I encourage you to go to our sermon series a couple years ago in the beginning, where Pastor Andrew kind of lays it all out in much more detail than we have time to today. But I'll say this here, that nowhere in Scripture does God reveal women to be less valuable than men. Okay? Both were created in God's image. Both were given dominion over the earth. Both were created to reflect God. Both were created to rule. Now, yes, there was an order And that God created man first, and then he created woman from man to be a helper for man. But really the way to look at that is that God was the first one to look upon men and say that he needs help, right? (laughs) And so being the fact that women are called the helper, it's pointing to the fact that there's a deficiency in men. 
Well, what were women created to help with? Help with reflecting God's character and love. Help filling and ruling over the earth. So when one man and one woman enter the covenant of marriage, there's an ordering by God's design. There are distinct roles the wife has and distinct roles the husband has. And you know, the same is true of the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit are all fully and equally God. One is not less than the other, yet they have different roles. And the role of God the Son is to submit to God the Father. And so to think that wives submitting to husbands makes them inferior or less valuable would be to think that God the Son is less valuable than God the Father, which just isn't true. Furthermore, every single one of us in, the room, in this room, we are called to submit to one another. The verse right before Paul gets into this, he says that we are to live lives submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. So wives submitting to husbands, it's simply an application of the principle that we're all called to live. <clears throat> so what does submission look like? What does submission look like? You can find a lot of opinions in our culture about what submission looks like. One common opinion is that submission means the wife puts her husband's professional career above her own. And that's certainly a sacrifice that shows respect to the husband. If there are children in nurture, it's certainly respectable for the wife to invest as much time as possible in those children in their early years. But every wife's vocation is not prescribed in Scripture. And so submission can look different in different relationships. One thing I love about the Bible is that it's not limited to one culture or one time period because the Bible aims at our motivations that drive our actions and behaviors. So to submit is to put yourself under. It's to think of others as more important than yourselves. And the clearest picture that we get of this is in Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2 says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. This is for all of us. But in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So submission is the mindset. It's an attitude. Submission is a posture of the heart, not a position of status. It's a posture of the heart, a posture that we are all called to take. In Ephesians 5, Paul links submission to showing respect. And respect certainly reveals itself through our behavior and our actions, but true respect is an attitude that flows from the heart. So rather than prescribe certain behaviors, Wives, let me just ask you a couple questions that try to get at the heart of your attitude towards your husband. <clears throat> First question. Wives, what do you desire for your husband? It's easy for, for us to think about what we want from our spouse, right? But what do you desire for your spouse? What good do you desire for them? Wives, let this become what fuels your prayer life on behalf of your husband. Second question I would ask is, if your friends or co-workers had never met your husband, what would they think about him based on how you talk about him? You see, our words are the reflection of our heart. And so how do you speak of your husband? Do you focus on his strengths or do you focus on his weaknesses? talking about wives submitting to husbands, this question always comes up. And that is, should wives always submit to their husbands? And I would say no. Emphatically, I would say no. I would say there are two reasons when wives should not submit to their husbands. First is in the case of abuse. If you're being abused, do not submit yourself to your husband in those ways. There is hope and there is healing for you. But first, that situation needs to come to the light. And so I would encourage you that if you're experiencing abuse or, or you're just not even sure, is this possibly abuse, to talk to someone that you trust. If you don't know who to talk to, you can t come and talk to one of the pastors here and we will help point you in the resources that are right. We will point you to authorities if that needs to be the case. Never submit yourself to abuse. Second time where wives should not submit to their husbands is in the case of disobeying God's clear commands. 
In Acts chapter 5, there's a story of a, a married couple in the early church. Their names were Ananias, the husband, and Sapphira, the wife. And Ananias and Sapphira, they had a piece of property that they sold, and they gave this, some money from what they sold to the church. It was, it was kind of an offering that they were giving to the church to help the church along. But what they did that was deceitful is they made it look and, and seem like they gave 100% of the sale to the church, but that wasn't true. The husband kind of decided to keep some back. He wanted to say he sold it all to look good before the church, but he really wanted to keep some for himself. And, and, and Sapphira, the wife, knew that this was the plan. Well, Ananias goes in to uh, talk with Peter, who was the leader of the church, the apostle. And Peter confronts him, calls out his lie. He says, you know, was this the amount that you sold for, what you gave? And he's like, yeah. And Peter's like, no, it's not. And God immediately judged him and struck him dead. Well, then the wife, Sapphira, comes in, and Peter asks her the same question. Is this how much you sold the property for? And she's covering for her husband and saying, yeah, it is. And God judges her as well. You see, you should never submit to your husband when he is clearly instructing you to disobey God's clear commands. If you follow in sin, you will be judged for your sin. Submission is a posture of the heart, not a position of status. Well, what about husbands? What about husbands? Ephesians 5.25 says this. <clears throat> it says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Love as Christ has loved. You know, husbands, the natural desire in us is for our wives to enhance our lives, right? For our wives to make us look good or to make our lives more comfortable. But we are called to expend our lives for the good of our wives. Nothing should be held back from your wife. If you have to die to protect her, husbands stand ready. But you are also called to lay down your desires and put her first each and every day. God's design is that husbands are the head of the home, which simply means that husbands are uniquely designed and called to lead. And if that tempts any guy in here to, to, to think with a big head that he is superior than his wife, think about this. God calls us the head. Heads have ears. So we should be listening to the concerns of our wives, right? We should be listening to the counsel of our wives. C.S. Lewis wrote this. He said, if because the husband is the head and the head wears a crown in marriage, it is a crown of thorns. See, biblical leadership is not marked by self-assertion, but self-sacrifice. So rather than place burdens upon your wife, seek to remove those burdens from her. Husbands, make your requests few and your offers to help many. Wives are meant to flourish under God's design of biblical leadership. Now, you've all heard the saying, a happy, life is a happy, a happy wife is a happy life, right? Your wife should rejoice in your leadership, but don't confuse this by thinking your ultimate aim is to make her happy. Your ultimate aim remains to please Christ. And so always trying to arrange circumstances so they are favorable to your wife, it fails to provide the spiritual care that she needs. Marriage is not ultimately about you or her, but it is about Jesus. And so your goal as a husband is to lead your wife to treasure Christ more and follow him gladly. You know, just like submission can't be neatly defined by a list of actions, leadership can't be defined by a list of actions either. The, the way I think of leadership, I think of leadership as a, a willingness to own responsibility. And, and admittedly, guys, a lot of times we don't want to lead because we don't want to bear the burden if things turn out poorly. Same thing happened in the garden with Adam and Eve. Adam was there present during the whole conversation with the serpent and Eve. But yet he was willing to kind of allow Eve to make the decisive move to, to, to take the fruit and to eat of it because he didn't want to bear the responsibility. He blame shifted her for everything. But husbands, it is your job to ensure the well-being of your wife physically, emotionally, and spiritually. So husbands, a couple questions for you. What are the burdens your wife carry? Could any of those burdens be alleviated by your humble leadership? Where are you taking your family spiritually? You don't have to have it all figured out, but do you, have you at least set a direction? And I know that can be intimidating. That can be intimidating, especially if you, if you have a wife who is godly and just, just outpacing you in terms of her commitment to the Lord. But just start small. Start with a conversation. 
You know, I can't tell you exactly what submission and leadership always looks like, but in our home, it, it looks like a lot of conversations. Bringing the other in to know what each other one is feeling and, and thinking. Well, as we wrap this up, whether you are married or unmarried, if you have experienced the love of God, you are called to imitate that love towards others. But how? How do we imitate the self-sacrificing love of God consistently? Especially in marriage, where flaws are so easily exposed. If you are waiting on your spouse to show you more respect or more affection before you offer yourself completely for their good, that is the death trap of marriage. See, you, you can't wait for your spouse to fill you with enough love to motivate you to love if you've, as you've been called to love. To love as Christ has loved. You need another filling. And that filling only comes from God's Spirit. How do you become filled with God's Spirit? Well, it begins by abandoning your sin. If there's known areas of your life of disobedience, it is turning away from those and clinging towards obedience, obeying, obeying what God's Word says. Being filled with the Spirit is done through continually expressing your adoration of Christ and living with thankfulness for all that He has done. And it also includes placing yourself under the care of others who will challenge and encourage you to live by faith. Again, if you're in a place where you don't know where to start, you need help, you can text HEALING to 41411. Let us get you the help to walk alongside you in this season of your marriage. You know, if we could do marriage on our own, Jesus would not have needed to come and die. Because the greatest obstacle to any of our marriages is the fact that we are self-serving. The fact that we are always thinking of things as, relate, as they relate to us. But Jesus gave himself up to rescue us from ourselves and to th- see that life is not about us, but about him. Mercy Hill, my desire is that years down the road, people will look in on the marriages of this church and they will say, surely that is a picture of love. Surely that is what love should look like, not because of the chemistry that's been maintained, but because of the promise that has been kept. The fact that there are two people who are generously giving of themselves for the good of the other to imitate God's love for their spouse. Let's pray. Father, it is a weighty thing to be called to act as you have acted, to love as you have loved. And God, we confess that we do not have the power, the energy to do that. But God, you have filled us with your spirit. And so God, I pray that our reflection of your love for us would motivate us to express love in sacrificial, radical ways for the good of our marriages, for the good of this church, God. I pray for those in the room that are are struggling, either in a struggling marriage or, or, or struggling with the idea of marriage, God. That you would help them to see that marriage points to a greater reality, a reality that can be theirs, a truer love. God, if they would place their faith in Jesus Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey guys, thanks for stopping by our YouTube channel. We hope that this, uh, this message is encouraging to you. We hope it stirs up your affections for Christ. If it's doing that, we would encourage you to subscribe to our channel. You can also share this message. If it's working in your life, maybe God wants to use it in somebody else's life, so you can always do that. Let me say a quick word to those of you who might be seeing this for the first time, or maybe you've been following our YouTube channel or listening to our teaching, but you haven't quite made that jump to come into the church yet. We know in today's society, most people listen to the teaching ministry of a church before they ever check it out. So uh, we know that might be a lot of people out there. If that's you, I would just encourage you to take that step. If you don't have a local church, man, don't rely on a teaching ministry on YouTube to be the local church because it's not the local church. We would love for you to come in and plug in, to use your gifts, to get into some relationships where people uh, can actually push on you and and you can be ministering in their life. Uh, There's no such thing as a Lone Ranger Christian. So man, come join us, take that step. We would love to meet you. Last thing I would say is this, hey, we know guys that the mission of God goes about as far as the generosity of God's people takes it. 
Um, if this message is a blessing to you or if you could see how it could be used in other people's lives, uh, we would really encourage you to financially support the ministry here at Mercy Hill. And you can do that by going to mercyhillchurch.com and uh, going right to our give page uh, and giving there. Uh, we love to see that happen as we continue to expand. All right. Thanks a lot, guys. See you next time.